gets and brings the word of God this morning. Good morning, church. You can take a seat. Thank you so much for your kind words and honor this morning. It was um, quite strange seeing videos on the screen that I had nothing, I knew nothing about, which is the greatest relief actually this morning. I was like, it had nothing to do with that. It was so great. Um, you know, Russell just said that it's been a privilege to have us here work out some of this stuff throughout the last 10 years and work out our calling and our gifts and sharpen ourselves and that kind of thing. But the, the privilege has truly been ours to, to find a community like this that would allow us to, to grow and to, to mature and to sharpen. And, um, yeah, the privilege has been all ours to be a part of this place. I've found this place so encouraging. I can't tell when I preach well or badly because everybody continues to encourage um, and I think that's a great thing. I've always found this place willing to champion the next generation and create space for things and for people. And I just want to encourage us to continue to do that, continue to do that wherever we, wherever we look with our band. We've got great worship leaders coming through. How anointed is Erica in, in what she's doing? And <laughs> let's just continue to create space for people to outwork themselves in ministry and what God's calling and yeah I guess I took so long on my P's because I, I feel like I was catching up with God as well I didn't know if I wanted to be a pastor to be honest I just wanted to be helpful um, I just wanted to do whatever God had called me to do and um, as you take step by step I think this is where it's found me out and this morning I guess I want to speak from that place I just want to bring what God has given me and be helpful this morning and I hope that this morning is challenging but is helpful as well and comes from a place that is what I have to offer today. Um, so this morning we're going to we're going to talk about um, we're going to revisit just a little bit of Centerpoint Church. I love speaking messages outside of series. Sometimes today's not part of a series, so to speak, but it gives us a chance to go. What do I really want to say? What do I think we really need to visit this morning? And I would love to speak for a little bit just about our identity at Centerpoint Church. Who are we? What should we be focusing? on. And over the last period of time, um, our, our teams have been taken through some of this stuff, but it's been important for us to gather our focus and say, where are we going as a church? What do we believe in? What do we stand for? What do we want to, to look like, to taste like, to feel like, to smell like? I don't know. And so I want to quickly run through some of the work that we've done on this this morning to help you understand the kind of place that we aim and aspire to be, but then also to unpack one particular part of it this morning and how it applies to our life. Um, so, we all are aware of our mission statement, aren't we? We pretty much say it every week. Can we get that one up there? It's to inspire people to make Jesus the center of their lives. This is right up there for us as a church. And it's not just for people we don't know, it's for us every single week. It's for people for the first time, and it's for people for the rest of time. That everything about our church would inspire people to place Jesus right back here. Right? So, everything points towards this for us as a church. But apart from this, there's something, some other things you may not have heard we're going to introduce to you this morning. Our vision, to establish churches that become an integral centre point in our communities. Chermside is part of this process right now still. How many think the last few years has been some great steps in becoming a more integral centre point in our communities? We have so many things going on here during the week now here at Chermside. The playgroup is absolutely pumping. It's just like to the walls full of families and children. Our cafe, it's becoming a focal point. And this is something that we want to continue to develop here, but it's also something we want to continue to develop in Tigham. We want that space to continue to become established and become a centre point to the community. And then who knows where this goes from there. As God blesses something, we can continue to touch more communities over the time that we're together. From here, we then have our 10 values. These are some things that we looked at that said, what is in our heart here at Centerpoint and what do we want to keep here? What do we love about this place? And I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's worship, growth, prayer, hospitality, gathering, people, generations, authenticity, generosity, and mission. And so we, we'll have time to unpack those, I'm sure, over there, and we'd love to present those more clearly to you. The one I want to spend most time on today 
is our last one, and it's our identity statement. It's who we are, right? It's what we aim to, to be. And it says, as a church, we are spiritual, we are relational, and we're missional. Have you ever been driving on the road and lost your focus? And quickly you realize you've missed your exit, right? You have no idea how it's happened, but now you're taking a wrong turn, you're in a suburb you knew nothing of, you're not where you not wanted to be or where you wanted to go. I think it's really important to make sure that we re revisit and establish our focus quite often because we can end up in a place where God has never called our church to be, doing things He's never called us to do if we don't have a strong focus on where we should be going. So it's important to remember who we are this morning, and we're going to start with this. If I was to ask you this morning, why does church exist? Why does this church exist? Why do churches exist? What is this for? We would all have different answers to explain what a church is for. And it might be our strongest motivation for why this place exists. It might be the thing that you've got most out of it, right? That might be your answer. We might say things like, it exists to reach the lost, and it does, right? We might say, it's a hospital for the broken. Have you heard of that one before? We might say, it's here to fund missions. We might say, it's a, it's a place for the lonely to find family and friends. We might say, it's a greenhouse for discipleship. Now, all these things are true, right? They're all, they're all great things, but we all have different opinions on what church should be about and what's most important for our function and focus. Our identity statements exist to help us cut through some of the reasons that we exist and focus. And we've done some work to go, what are our values and what do these reflect? They reflect three things, that we are spiritual, we are relational, and we are missional. And we believe that these are the three most key areas in the life of a believer functioning in the body of Christ. Now, on the surface... These words seem like I could have picked them from spiritual bingo night, right? Like, if you're sitting there waiting for me to say words in this sermon to cross them off your church bingo card, those three will probably come up, uh, among many other things. Why are these words more important than, than others, so to speak? Because I want to point, point out how important these are to how we function, how important they were to Jesus and His ministry today. These three words all depend on each other and they build upon each other. So rather than seeing them like this, you might see them um, with the circles, Salesy. You might see them like this. They are interdependent, but they build upon each other, right? They are not necessarily, um, they, are, they are equally necessary, but they also have a disproportionate priority to each other, right? We unapologetically say here that there is an order of priority to these things in our lives. Here's the spoiler this morning. Being spiritual is of first priority. Being relational is of second priority. And being missional is of third priority. Now, this may come as a confronting statement to you. And if you are confronted by that, please just wait a minute. We will get to it. I'm going to explain this. All, all three things are necessary and important. Are you hearing me? You're hearing the word necessary. Like, you will not function, we will not function as a church without these three things. But they are differing in priority. Three things can be absolutely necessary but prioritized differently. Who's heard of the three rules of survival, or the, the threes of survival, or the threes of the human body? It says that you can last three weeks without food, three days without water, and about three minutes without oxygen. Anyone heard that before? Some people say there's another three, it's a three hours without shelter or something like that. But I'm not a survival guy, if you couldn't tell. How many know that food is absolutely necessary? Can I get an amen for people that are, food is absolutely necessary. But if you don't have water, food doesn't matter all that much. You're not going to last very long, all right? How many know that water is absolutely necessary? But if you don't have water, if you don't have oxygen, forget about the water, right? You're not going to last very long, right? All three elements are required, 
But food really only matters if the cells in the body have water to function and accommodate it. Everything is, is shuts down when you're dehydrated, right? And water really only matters if you have oxygen in your brain to tell the cells what to do with it, right? Our life source foundation is oxygen. It's what's in our lungs. And upon this is water. And upon this is food. Are you following me this morning? All three completely necessary. You will die without any one of them eventually, all right? But there's a priority in place here. And this is how I see the three areas in our church identity statement this morning. All three are necessary to the body, but there is an order of urgency and priority to them. See, it's our spiritual life that will make our relationships flourish. And it's our relational life upon which missions and the mission is accomplished. Nothing we do in, in for God is done on our own, right? And I think sometimes we miss this. I think sometimes we get this mixed up. I think sometimes we think we, pl- we put things in priority or at number one that maybe shouldn't be there, and it ends up us missing turns and missing places that God has called us to be. You know, I think sometimes we hear like, church cliches and statements and things that make us think certain things are more important than others. And I've got a couple here that might have stuck in your mind. They're all, they're all very true, by the way, but they're just, they can make us think things are more valuable than others. One of them I've heard is, Jesus's last command, our first priority. Who's heard that statement before? It is usually said to say the last word that Jesus said was the most important. What did he say? He said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we say this to put missions up the top. But nowhere does it say, oh, this is the last thing I'm going to say, so it's the most important, right? It's just something that sounded really good to make something sound really important. Now, it is really important. It's absolutely necessary, and we'll get to that scripture properly in a minute. But sometimes we can take away from a statement or a cliche something that we were never supposed to take right? Who's heard of the um, statement, belong before you believe? Now, I believe you can do this. I'm I'm not having a dig at that statement. But sometimes when we say to people, you can come and you can belong before you believe, we say that belonging is what this is all about. People get this idea that, oh, I can just, I can just hang around. And we never, we can get to this point where the the community side of what we do is on this pedestal. This relationship side of church is what it's all about. And we never know if people end up leaving from belong to believe sometimes. Now, whilst mission and Jesus' last command and relationships and community are vital, they need to be placed in order of priority for good health and function of this body and your life as well. So we're going to take a look at the life of Jesus this morning and just show how he modeled this as well so you know that I'm not making it up, all right? That's usually a good thing. Now, Jesus was spiritual, relational, and missional in order. We're going to talk about three reasons why this has happened, why we see this this morning. First, we're going to talk about Jesus' priority, then we're going to talk about Jesus' pattern, and then Jesus' command, what He actually said was most important. So, first of all, Jesus leaves, he, He starts His ministry, right, and He goes and gets baptized. Where does He go after He is baptized? He goes straight into the desert for, was that a relational experience? Was that a missional experience? That was an intensely spiritual experience where he was tested in every way, where the devil came. He said he came and tested him on food, but it wasn't about food, was it? It was about his spirit. It was about who he got his life source from. He said, I I don't live on bread alone but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus went straight into a spiritual exercise, a spiritual battle. The first thing he thought he could do when he started his ministry, he didn't just go start talking and then, oh, I forgot to pray. No, he went straight in and it says he came out full of the power of the Holy Spirit. The first priority on Jesus' list was spiritual, right? After this, there's a few different accounts of it. He goes to the temple and he announces his arrival, essentially. He says, I am here in your midst. And then he goes to call his disciples. Some people say that he did a few 
miracles on the way and this and that. But the general pattern of what Jesus did was he next went to call his disciples. He went out and started saying, come and follow me, come and follow me, come and follow me. And the majority of his mission happened after he had established these two areas in his life, spiritual, relational, and missional. I like to think of it as he went from deserts to the the desert, to disciples, then to the demons, right? That's the order in which Jesus generally approached his prioritization of his ministry. But then you can look at the pattern, the overall picture of Jesus' life. It wasn't like the desert was the last time he was spiritual, was it? No, we see it all the time. He goes and retreats to a lonely place to pray, that he was up early in the morning, away from the disciples, and he was praying. He was doing spiritual things often throughout his ministry. But how many know Jesus copped criticism because he was too relational sometimes, right? He went to parties, he ate with sinners, he was at weddings. I love the picture of the Last Supper, where Jesus is sitting around with the disciples, and John, who wrote about himself, said the Beloved was upon his chest, you know. But you got this picture of John resting his head against Jesus' chest in, in just relaxing, and Jesus was a man on a mission, but he was also a man deeply connected to other people and in relationship. And we know, I don't need to explain too much the fact that Jesus was on mission, do I? He was healing people, he was casting out demons, he was, he was ministering to the sick, he was with the children, he was ministering on mission. Jesus was a man on mission. So, his pattern, we can see, was one of spiritual, relational and missional. But what did Jesus say? There's an explicit command that Jesus gives us in Matthew 22, 36 to 38. And I think it's quite sobering to revisit this this morning. It says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus says that our first priority should be to love Him. To worship Him. That every area of our life, loving God is our first priority. Obeying God is our first priority. This is why our mission statement is to inspire people to make Jesus the centre of their lives. Because that's what we're here to do. Jesus must be first, right? Right? This is the greatest commandment. This is the first priority. Because every good relationship we ever have and every effective mission we work on will come from this place of desiring to obey and love God first. You know, John 15, 5, there's this, Jesus talks about the branches. And it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus knew this principle in his mission. Do we know this principle in ours? It doesn't matter how much food you eat or how much water you drink. (laughs) Without the oxygen in your lungs, there's no point. Can you imagine trying to have your dinner tonight while holding your breath? And you're going, I'm dying and I'm just trying to eat more food and drink more water. Really, you needed to connect again to the life source that is in your lungs, right? Now, let's go back. Um, So, we're we're spiritual people first, and we do spiritual things, is the catchphrase here at Centerpoint. We want to be a house and a people that prioritize spiritual things above the others. Praying, fasting, giving, serving, sacrificing, singing, all the other things that we would consider spiritual things that cultivate the spiritual life within us. These need to be high on our list of priorities. Let's go back to the words of Jesus for the second priority. In Matthew 22, it says, And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus' second command has to do with how we treat each other. And I think we miss something in this passage sometimes when we see the word neighbor. I think sometimes we have thought this means a person that is, like, far away from us. And I think 
sometimes we get this idea, because the, the, the account of this passage is in, in Luke, they ask Jesus, well, who is my neighbour? And he responds with the story of the Good Samaritan, right? So, we get in our mind that our neighbour is a person that we're going to encounter one day on a road who's been beaten up and I can just bandage them up and that's, my, that's what love my neighbour means. Like the, the Samaritan being a foreigner, someone who's not like me and someone who's in an extraordinary circumstance. Jesus wants us to include those people, but that's not the essence of what love your neighbour is about, Right? Love your neighbour is the word rea in Hebrew, right? And it in fact means neighbour, someone who is near, right? And in fact, the word used in Matthew, rea, is the exact same word used in Leviticus, um, which will get up there, right? Where it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, this is a word to the Israelites on how they treat each other, okay? But love your neighbour as yourself. When Jesus said this to the people in the book of Mark or Matthew, wherever we are here, Matthew, they would have known exactly what he was talking about. It's not about loving someone who you don't know yet, necessarily. Sure, have love for those people, but what is God calling us to? He's referring to the people right in front of you. He's referring to the people right beside you in church this morning. He's referring to your family. How many know it can be quite easy to show kindness to people that aren't that close to you? It's actually quite a lot harder sometimes to show love, to show kindness to people you know. How many know it's harder to bless your brother or your sister than it is a friend you barely see? when you know how annoying they are, right? When you know their flaws, when you know their intentions sometimes, you know? When you have history with that person, when you remember what they've said to you or done to you in the past and you can't get over it. When you know that there's a good chance that they'll still be in your life next week and they're probably going to hurt you again. It's so much harder to love your neighbour than it is to love a stranger. And I believe that God holds us accountable for how we love the body and those near to us more so than how we treat those we don't even know. I believe that that is the ethic of Jesus and what He is challenging us to do. We cannot be a people who are engaged with missional things far from us whilst disengaged with relational things right in front of us that is completely hypocritical for us as followers of Jesus. We will preach a love that we know nothing about. We will extend a grace that we know nothing about giving to people. We will spend our time inviting people to belong in a church community that displays none of the characteristics they claim to believe in. Why would we be here if our homes, our families our community here does not reflect first the love of God. We talk about inviting people to church. What are we inviting them to? What kind of place are we inviting them to? Is it a loving family? Is it a place that knows how to forgive? Is it a place that values reconciliation? Is it a place where we know how to apologize when we've wronged somebody? Can we be a people who can carry one another's burdens? Can we be a people who learn to encourage and spur one another on, right? We must be people who show hospitality and warmth. We must be people who gather and value each other's presence, who laugh, have fun, who hang out outside of a Sunday. These are relational things and we are relational people. But lastly, we are missional people and we do missional things, amen? Now we come to the final command of Jesus that we talked about before in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We can never lose sight that God has not just saved us from something, He has saved us for something. We are people who must be missional. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do 
good works which God prepared for us in advance to do. Jesus didn't just save us so that we could love Him and love others and your family and your church. He saved you to do something. He saved you for something. There's a great scripture here in Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. It says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we'll grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I'd love to quickly just point out the pattern here again, right? We have from Him, that's spiritual. Nope. Sorry, go back to that scripture, please. Joined and held together, that's relational. Each part does its work, that's missional, right? Work is not a dirty word. Sometimes it can be in church circles, but work is not a dirty word. God created us for works, right? It's integral to our faith, it's integral to the body of Christ growing, it's integral to this community, and it's integral for each one of us as individuals. And if we can become a people that can hold these three areas in tension, in balance with each other, and in right priority, we can become the people in the church God's calling us to be. Chaminder, if I could get you up on the keys, mate. I want to ask you the question that I often ask at this point in the sermon. It's how are you going today in these areas? How are we going? I think that naturally, we all tend to favour one, two, maybe three, but we might have a natural bent towards one over the other and be completely disconnected from another. We might be people who are spiritual only, relational only, missional only. We might be people who are really passionate about the spiritual and the missional side of what we're here for, but just for the life of us, can't value the relational side. We might be people who are spiritual or relational, but don't have a revelation on what God's called us to missionally. And we could be people that are relational or missional, but disconnected from the head. Just depending on what you maybe have experienced or what you value or how you've come to Christ, there's all sorts of reasons. And you might be already seeing this and going, I can see where I, where I fit here. I'm going to quickly run through these. We can, be, we can be only spiritual people sometimes, Right? And completely absent in these areas. And have you ever heard the? I've heard um, I've heard Pastor Russell use this saying once. I don't know if he'll want me to say that actually, but he got it from someone else. It's not his own opinion. But you can be too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you ever met people that are just spiritual, but there's nowhere to apply it, no one to apply it with, and nowhere to apply it to. And it's it's something odd about it something strange about it. And when, when, when those people get asked to do anything missional or something relational, it's like, oh, the Lord hasn't... We can't just be one without the others. Maybe you're just relational. Maybe you're just here for the community, for the friends, to belong. However, the moment your relationships go south, so goes your faith. The moment you have a crisis with a person... It's like, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't interested in this God thing anyway. And you may not even find out until that moment happens that that was what you're working with. Maybe you're just missional. Maybe you're just looking for a cause. Maybe causes make you feel good. I guess in the world we might call this virtue signaling. It's one of those favourite words going around at the moment. But it's no different than really what the world is up to, is it? Just looking for a cause, looking for something to do, looking to make a difference. And in this context, we can appear to be spiritual by that. Maybe even sometimes we appear relational. But the moment you realise that this church or these people aren't going to push your agenda or your passion, you're not interested in God all of a sudden and you'd rather make a real difference, you know, somewhere else. This is what happens when we can be too missional. Maybe you're here today and you value the spiritual and relational. 
but there's a disconnect between you and actually the works of what God has called us to do and the mission of God. Maybe you're just here to journey with God and others and go to my life group and talk about my problems, then come back again next week and talk about their problems. I love the services and the Word and it makes me feel good. But when somebody asks me to serve or to to carry something or to get involved with the mission, oh, no thanks, that's uncomfortable. I'm not really interested in that. Give my time? No, no, sorry, I'm busy. Give my finances? Oh, sorry, interest rates. Eventually you realise that in the body of Christ, you don't fit. Because eventually the people around you want to do something missional and you don't want to be taken on that journey and you separate yourself from other people. You know, John 7, 38 says, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Can I tell you, what comes to you must flow through you. Can we remember that this morning? What comes to you must flow through you. God has given you something that should be flowing through you to this world. Right? Do you know what happens to a river that stops flowing? It turns into a swamp. <laughs> it starts to stink becomes a home for parasites and mosquitoes to come and lay their eggs and it just is a it's a source of terror to the anywhere nearby when it becomes when it loses its flow and you can take that metaphor as far as you would like when it comes to our lives but God has created us to be people who flow not who people who block what has come to you must go through you You can be spiritual and missional, but not relational. Can I tell you, no mission you ever do will be a part of, will be done on your own. Not worth, not much worth doing will be done outside of a team environment. What this will usually lead to is possibly mistreating people around you, manipulating people. So caught up with the mission that God has put on your heart that you steamroll people around you to make it happen. We want to make a difference so badly for God that we forget that there's people that we've offended that we need to apologize to. There's people that have hurt us that we currently hate that we need to forgive. Oh God, I just want to make a difference for you. And he's like, no, you've missed the point here. Right? Matthew 5, 23 to 24, Jesus teaches on this. And he says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there right in front of the altar. First go be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Jesus makes a clear statement here. Is that true worship of God involves right relationships with other people. There is nothing you can do that is more important for God than loving your neighbor and having good relationship with those around you. We miss the point if we miss this. Mary and Martha, who knows the story of Mary and Martha? They're both at the house with Jesus and Martha is busy on mission, serving Jesus, for Jesus, right? And Mary's sitting at his feet, just wanting to be with him. And Jesus says to Martha that Mary has chosen better, that Mary has chosen correctly, right? Because she wanted Jesus, not to serve Jesus necessarily. This last area, which is where we're going to land it this morning, is the space that I think we can find ourselves in where I'd like to maybe more specifically address this morning. And it's being missional and relational, but not spiritual. We can sit in this space as Christians for a very long time. A very long time. And sometimes not even realize that we've been disconnected from the head for years. We can join all the teams, we can be in all the life groups, we can be involved in community, we can show up to church on a Sunday, all of this whilst being completely dry in the presence of God. No spiritual life cultivated whatsoever. And this can be a terrible place to find ourselves. And can I tell you, 
I've been there a number of times. And we always get found out eventually. We begin to resent the things that we're doing and the areas that we're serving in and the times we have to forgive people because we were doing it, whether it might be for our own gratification, maybe to impress the other people in our church or relationships and not as if we were unto God. And it makes us bitter. It makes us resentful. One of the most guaranteed ways to burn out as a Christian is to do spiritual things from a non-spiritual place. It will tear you apart, slowly but surely. You know, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It says, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. You know, we can be busy casting out demons in his name, on mission with each other, building the body, attending life groups, going to youth, going to young adults. But in the end, did we know God? Did we live a life that loved him? Did we live a life that honored him? Did we live a life that knew him? Now, if we can get those, all of those ones up again, sales, those ones... This is for you to look at today and go, do with it what you like. This is just, I hope, a helpful tool to help us assess our own hearts this morning. But if I was to more specifically say, what what are we looking for this morning? I would love to call people back to the things of the Spirit. I would love to call people back to connection with the vine, to connection with their Creator, that we would not be people who are too caught up in being here and doing things with each other, without first having that life source connected to us as a church. We cannot do this without Him. I think the life of a believer should look like sitting down and having a hot meal. How many have ever thought, I better take a breath after this bite? Or I better take a drink after this bite? When you sit down and you have a hot meal, you have your drink maybe, your food and your breathing and you're not conscious of any of it it's all happening I'm not thinking like oh I can't wait to finish this bite so I can take a breath no the life of a believer I think should look like all three of those things in constant community with each other have you ever had a cold and tried to eat dinner (laughs) right your nose is totally blocked and you're just like (laughs) trying to chew it down and swallow and take a big breath I don't think that's what God's called us for. I think He's called us for the meal at the table to be doing all these things at the same time. And I want to tell you this morning, it's time to take a breath. It's time to reconnect with your life source. Connect back to the vine. I don't know, maybe you're in this room today and it feels like I've been holding my breath. Everything feels hard. Everything feels difficult. All my relationships are in trouble. I can't, I can't stick to anything that God wants me to do. I want to encourage you to take a breath this morning, to reconnect to the Spirit of God, to the spiritual things God has called us to do. And we can sing songs and make it non-spiritual. We can come to church and it not be spiritual. We can read our Bibles and it not be spiritual. It's all about your connection in your heart. And I would love to call people back to that place where they know God this morning, where they're aware of Him, Because this is who we are. We're spiritual people and we do spiritual things. We're going to do a spiritual thing this morning to represent this connection again with the Father and that is communion. If you um, haven't got one of these communions, feel free to raise your hand and our ushers will bring those around to you. I wonder this morning if we could just all bow our heads and close our eyes. In a moment, we're all going to take this and
going to symbolize a reawareness, a reconnection.